A few months ago, one of the executives in our department left on very short notice, which, uh, needless to say, really put our department on the spot as there was no one to uh, replace him. The day he left, the vice president of our department, who is my boss, called me in and told me he was going to try and divide up the work amongst uh, a couple of the pe people in the department. The two people he had already spoken to did not want the uh, additional responsibility. They, uh, they didn't exactly turn him down flat, but they told him that they were very busy as it was and they didn't exactly volunteer. So he asked me if I wanted to handle some of the overload. Well, I've always made it a policy of mine to never turn down anything that looked like an opportunity. And that's what this looked like to me. So I said, yeah, I'll take the whole job. He looked pretty surprised, but I think he was uh, pleasantly surprised. After he left uh, my office, I got together with my secretary and we did some uh, work on my incoming and outgoing phone calls where all the incoming calls were taken in the morning and the outgoing calls were taken in the evening. And my secretary also took on a lot more responsibility and a lot more of the chores herself which she was uh, very, very happy to do. And after about two weeks of this, my secretary and I were handling twice the calls, twice the meetings, about half again as many personal conferences, and the work week actually seemed to go a lot faster. Last week, the boss called me in again, told me the uh, board was very happy with the work that we've been doing and uh, offered me a new job, make the job permanent with a new title and a raise to go along with it. So I guess that shows you that necessity is not only the mother of invention, it's the mother of opportunity as well. I wanted you to hear that man's story because it illustrates one of the best ways I know to stimulate creative thinking. In one word, capacity. In any endeavor you choose to pursue, the success formula is first, do what you do better, and second, do more of it. Improve both the quality and the quantity of your output. That second part means increasing your capacity. Remember our analysis of time excusitis? This is where you can put that cure to work. There is a two-step procedure that can show you how. First, always eagerly accept the opportunity to do more. It's a compliment to be asked to take on new responsibility. Accepting greater responsibility on the job makes you stand out. It shows you're more valuable. Now the second step is this. Concentrate on how can I do more. Ask that question and creative answers are certain to come. Now some of these answers may be better planning and organization of your present work or taking intelligent shortcuts in your routine activities or possibly dropping some non-essential activities altogether. But again, the solutions for doing more will appear when you ask the question, how can I do more? Earlier, I cited an old business axiom. If you want something done, give it to a busy person. I personally refuse to work on any project with someone who has plenty of time. The lesson I've learned from painful experience over the years is that the person with plenty of time generally wants to keep it that way. He's more interested in avoiding responsibility than he is in increasing his output. All successful, competent people are busy. All the successful businesses I know are busy. These businesses constantly ask themselves, how can they increase their output? Now, why not ask yourself the same question? How can you increase your output? Capacity is one tool for success. Another is the skill of listening. In any organization, whether it's government or business or the arts or any other endeavor, listening becomes more important and more prevalent the higher you go up the executive ladder. The more responsible the position, the more likely the person holding it is to be a good listener. You will never find an executive in any healthy organization buttonholing someone in the hall and running down all their problems to them. That's the tactic of a mediocre person, the one who's envious of the power and success of others. If you have a conversation with a high-level executive at work, you'll probably find that the executive encourages you to do most of the talking, while he or she does most of the listening. That's the mark of a leader. Success-minded people tend to monopolize the listening, while small-minded people tend to monopolize the talking. The reason for this is that a leader in any field is a kind of human decision-making machine. And for that machine to work, it has to have raw materials. And the raw materials for making decisions are the ideas and opinions of other people, in addition to one's own. Other people won't provide answers and solutions, but they will provide the grist for the leader's creative mill. 
So if you walk into a top-level meeting in General Motors or the White House or the local school board, you'll most likely find that the person in charge is listening to what others have to say. That person knows that listening is what will give them the information they need to make tough, important decisions. To develop your own listening skills, try this procedure. First, encourage others to talk. In personal conversations or in group meetings, draw out other people with phrases like, tell me about your experience, or what do you think should be done about this, or what do you feel is the key point here. This will give you two important benefits. Your mind soaks up raw material that you can then use to produce creative thought, and you'll also win the friendship and the respect of others. Next, test your own views in the form of questions. Let other people help you smooth and polish your ideas. Use the, what do you think of this? suggestion approach. But don't be dogmatic. Don't announce a fresh idea as if it were handed down to you on a golden tablet. Do a little information research first. See how your associates react to the idea. If you do this, chances are you'll end up with a better idea. Finally, concentrate on what the other person says. Listening is more than just keeping your mouth shut. Listening means letting what's said really penetrate your mind. So often, people pretend to listen when they're really not listening at all. They're just waiting for the other person to pause so they can take over the talking. Concentrate on what the other person says. Evaluate it. That's how you collect mind food. This is who, my mother was a Sunday school teacher. What you want me to be? What? My mother was a Sunday school teacher. She taught church Sunday school. That's what I was raised in. What, what else I'm gonna be? What? But I have to come in places that are different and let you be who you are. Because I am not right and you are wrong. You are right. You are 1,000% correct in Islam. Islam is 1,000% correct. It's your faith. How can I say it different? My faith works for me. It is for me. It is in my heart. It works for me. My God has to judge me for me. Your Highness told me yesterday, he said, he do, I can't repeat everything because it's very private, but he's such a, such a brilliant man. He understood. He said, man, there is a heaven, there is a hell. How you get there, that's up to you. I just want to go to heaven. I don't, my life, I had enough hell. I don't want no more. I just want to go see heaven. I don't, what it is, is I'm assuming some of us is going. I'm assuming some of us ain't. You just have to decide. I just, I, I'm, I'm thinking about going now. Now the room kind of got a little tight on this subject right here. So we're going to move past this. I was just telling you who I am. That's who I am. If you can accept that about me, I can accept it about you. Huh? And uh, yesterday, my man Jay, he bought a uh, tailor to my room. And uh, I got, how many did I make, Jay? Four? I made, they making eight caftans for me. So tomorrow, it's caftans? Eight, he made, they made eight of them for me. So tomorrow, I'm going to have on my caftan tomorrow. I'm going to be rocking the caftan when you see me tomorrow. Yeah. I haven't quite figured this out yet. I don't know. I've been trying to work that out. I'm a, Cause a lot of y'all like the way y'all do it. Like the dude right there, he got he is cocked up on one side. I like that. Then the other dude, he got hit in one dude head. He is pulled over. I said, Whoo! so I gotta see. I gotta figure my style out, you know. But I have my cap there tomorrow. I'm gonna have it later today, so I'm gonna be nice. I think Steve's gonna start some fashion trends in the UAE tomorrow. Uh, Steve. Yeah, I kind of messed up though because. I was trying to get some more stuff put on it, you know, some embroidery, and he told me, you, you cannot do it. I wanted to put some, you know, some designs on it. He told me I can't do that, so I'm going to have to. I got one white one, but I got a lot of other colors. Just wanted to try something other than white. I just, y'all see me, I'm going to have on a blue one. I got green, yellow, gold, blue. Oh, yeah, 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 don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. This Steve Harvey, I'm a star. Don't worry about that. I'm going to look different. <laughs> Everybody going, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Somebody got to do it. Steve, you are a star. Now the success has continued. It doesn't seem like you're going to stop anytime soon, to be honest. So is it fair to say you can never be too successful? Is that a fair statement? When does it stop? When is it OK to stop? Well, that's up to the individual. I think in my line of work, 
If I retire, what do I do? What? A lot of people retire and they just wither away. They dry up. They sit. I've seen old people retire and they just start folding up. They stop going to work. They stop living. I don't know that I can do that because I'm different now. I'm, I'm, I'm a, a motivational speaker. I travel. I'm taking my foundation to Africa. I'm, I don't. If I stop doing that, what I'm gonna do? You know, I I was talking to my sons one day. One of my sons is here. And I was telling him, I said, one day I'm gonna stop working. You're gonna take over. I'm gonna be on a yacht out in the middle of the ocean. I want you to send my money to me out on my yacht. He said, okay, dad, I'm gonna send you your money. Then I got to looking at him. I said, he probably ain't gonna send me all of it. So I probably need to keep working. Washington did something for me. He started planting seeds in my mind that enabled me to begin to dream as Dexter has been doing for you. And ladies and gentlemen, I started working on my dream. And most people don't work on their dreams. Why? For many years, I didn't. One is because of fear. The fear of failure. What if things don't work out? And the fear of success. What if they do and I can't handle it? The other thing is that most people, ladies and gentlemen, they get comfortable. They stop growing. They stop working on themselves. They stop stretching. 
they stop pushing themselves and they end up becoming very cynical about life and they throw in the towel on themselves and on their families and on their dreams. And the other thing is that most people don't feel worthy. What I'm doing now, I could have been doing years ago, but because I did not have a college education, because I didn't believe in myself, because I allowed other people's opinion of me to control my destiny, I didn't act on my ideas. So I applaud you for your dreaming, for your running toward your dream. I applaud you for believing in yourself because that's what life is about, stretching and challenging, looking for ways that you can begin to improve yourself. And ladies and gentlemen, as a result of stretching out, of acting on my dream, and I don't know what that dream is for you, I can tell you that it's possible. No one could have convinced me that after just over six years, I will have my own book entitled Live Your Dreams. Just over six years, I will have five specials on public television. Just over six years, I've done motivational speaking for AT&T, Procter & Gamble, McDonald's Corporation, Xerox, IBM, just over six years. I will now have my own talk show that will premiere on Monday, Labor Day. I'm saying to you, your dream is possible. I'm wealthy because of my friends. It's one of the greatest wealths of all, friendship. Those wonderful people who know all about you and still like you, right, friends? I just lost a friend. David died two, three years ago. He was the one I used to talk about. If I was stuck in a foreign jail accused unduly, if they would allow me one phone call, I would have called David. Why would I call him? He would come and get me. End of story. That's what you call friend, right? somebody who would come and get you. Next, I said I'm wealthy because of what I've learned. I'm wealthy from the people who have taught me, from the Earl Schoffs of the world, and from other people that have made a contribution to my intellectual discovery, that have helped me to refine the track I live on, for good health, for prosperity, for all the things valuable. Can't put a price tag on someone's book or someone's conversation. Someone who gives you knowledge when you need it the most. When you can't think of the ideas, your head is so clouded maybe with despair and the cloud of difficulty hover near. This is when you need somebody to whisper valuable information in your ear that helps you to survive and then to finally succeed. What is that knowledge worth? You can't put a price tag on it. What's the seminar worth? You couldn't put a price tag on it. The cost of the seminar pays for the lights and the room and somebody like me to come and the staff and all the other things. But the price of the seminar can't be the ideas. Here's what we have to do. Charge you for all the stuff and then the ideas are free. Because how could you put a price tag on the ideas? That would be impossible. If you read a book that spared you from having a heart attack, what would it be worth? Someone says, 1995. Say, no. No. That's what it costs. That's what it costs for the cover and the ink and the pages and the words and getting it to you and the brokers and all the stuff in between. That's the $20. You couldn't pay for the ideas. They're free. Key thing I've learned, never begrudge the money you spend on personal education. Because if you can keep developing your mind and your perception and your awareness and your ability to discover, the fortune is yours. The health is yours. The promise is yours. A good family relationship is yours. Friendship is yours. Everything is yours. If you keep accelerating your education, it's the best money you can invest in your personal self-education. Next, I said, I'm a wealthy man because of my future. You can't believe the people who say to me, Jim Rohn, what do you want to do in the future? We've got the wealth and the resources to do anything you want to do. What do you want to do? Do you know how unbelievable that is? What do you want to do? Incredible. Well, I was lucky. I wasn't searching for a mentor, but one just sort of fell in my lap. A friend of mine said, you've got to meet this guy I've gone to work for, Earl Shelf. He's rich, but he's easy to talk to. He's got a unique philosophy of life and business. I said, okay, yeah, I got to meet this guy. And then I met him. He invited me to join him in his business and became my mentor. I got the sense right away he delighted just as much in other people's success as he did his own. That caught my attention right away. Then he had the ability to look into the future and see the possibilities that I couldn't see. I can't remember how often he said, trust me i'm telling you trust me here's how it will go if you'll stay steady and do it right see that was great mentoring then bill bailey we've been associated in business and projects for many many years bill's unique bill can read a 200 page book in about 20 minutes and then tell you about this book and make it more interesting than if you read it yourself and from his shakespeare acting to his boxing career and then the 
Navy and his business career of wealth and productivity. Years ago, of course, he was the big game hunter, the larger than life character. It's just been my good fortune to know him all these years. On the second bottle of wine down on our goat farm in Kentucky, where we're in business together, we wax eloquent. He's a great conversationalist, and I ask a question and he poses some possibilities that I never thought of, and I'm sure I do the same for him. It's great to have that kind of interchange where you kind of wonder together about things. Say, so this could be a possibility, this could be an answer, who knows? Then he's written his own poetry that's unique, and his studies and his concepts are valuable for me. But best of all is simply the friendship, the chance to get together, not just share ideas, but just enjoy unique life experiences. And then my parents, you know, they were unique. My father was remarkable in his bit of philosophy. He said, always do more than you get paid for to make an investment in your future. That's a pretty good seminar in itself. My mother was more of a reader and a scholar and taught me well, gave me a great foundation, primarily gave me just a great place to live and a great place to stay and learn and grow. Then the sense that when I did leave home, that no matter what happened, I could always go home. So you better treat me right, I can go home. You know, who needs this? I just had that attitude not to be arrogant, but I just had that unbelievable confidence that no matter how things turned out, whether it turned out right or went upside down, for my mom and dad, it didn't matter. I could always go home. Mom would bake me biscuits and cook me oatmeal. That relationship was just really unique. It was great between my parents. They had, what, 65 plus years of marriage, so it was long, long. But then they gave me that incredible sense of security and caring that whether I did it right or did it wrong or upside down, it really didn't matter. That home was always a place you could come and get some rest and think things through and work it out and then go back and conquer the rest of the world and see what you can do. There's really not much better sense of security than that. And of course now they're gone and I'm an orphan. I haven't got a mother and a father, but the lingering influence of my growing up years plus that kind of security and tranquility and sense of refuge from a busy world and out there doing the best you can and that they truly loved me when I was rich and when I was poor broke and struggling and when I did well and then they enjoyed my success and, and the applause and some of the experiences of being recognized and they enjoyed that so it was great I would wish the same kind of experience for everyone and then I counsel parents to the best of my ability provide that kind of security and framework for your children that they feel comfortable even though they misstep cross the line get in trouble upside down if a kid gets in trouble guess who he wants to call his mother you know she'll come and get me Papa may say to the sheriff well I'll leave him in jail overnight, but not mama. No, if she's there, she'll come. The scripture says God hastens his word to perform it. That word hasten means quickly, speedily, in a hurry. And I'm not saying that we don't have to wait. There are things that take time. What I'm saying is when you don't see anything happening, it looks like what you're up against is never going to change. When you come into your destiny moment, God will do it speedily quicker than you thought. You'll accomplish a dream in a fraction of the time. That obstacle looks permanent, suddenly it turns around. That's God hastening his word. Second Kings chapter seven, the Israelites were surrounded by the Syrian army. They had cut off the Israelites' food supply. Now the people were starving, just a matter of time before they died. Every circumstance said it was permanent. The enemy army was bigger, they had more equipment. All the odds were against the Israelites. But there were four lepers sitting outside the city gates. They thought, we have nothing to lose. We're going to die anyway. Let's go down to the Syrian camp and see what they're doing. While they were walking toward the enemy, the scripture says God calls the Syrians to hear the sound of speeding chariots and galloping horses, the footsteps of a vast army approaching. The Syrian king thought the Israelites had hired several armies to attack them. Verse seven says, the Syrians panicked and fled into the night, leaving all their horses, tents, and belongings. What was that? God causing their enemies to hurry out of their way. Seemed impossible.
could, should, won't. Could, should, don't. It's called disaster. Now, how do you change all that? The next six years, I got rich. The next six years, I became a millionaire. By the time I'm 31, I'm a millionaire. How about that? You say, well, Mr. Rohn, what happened? Well, strangely enough, during that second six years of my economic life, the government was about the same. I'm telling you, taxes were about the same. My negative relatives were the same. I'm telling you, the economy was about the same, and prices were about the same, and everything else was about the same. Circumstances were about the same. Then how come I got rich? How come I totally changed my life? I was not the same. Somebody says, well, what did you go to work on to do all that? I started with my philosophy. I started amending my error by doing some better thinking, changing my mind, coming up with ideas that I didn't have before I met my children. And once that whole process started for me, I'm telling you, I changed my whole life. Within a six year period, I was never the same. And I've kept up that process all these years. One of the reasons why I'm here is to continue my craft. I don't want the day to come someday. Somebody says, you should have heard Jim Rohn 10 years ago when he was really terrific. Guess what I want people to say? I heard him 10 years ago, but you should hear him now. I'm telling you the man works on his craft. I'm telling you the man's done some extra reading. I'm telling you the man doesn't miss a trick. I'm telling you he's worked hard on himself. That's why he's able to deliver like the same thing can happen for you as a teenager. It can happen to you as a mother, as a father, as a business person, as a salesperson, running a business. It doesn't matter. Management, wherever you find yourself. This is the process called personal change. What I say, start with is start with your own philosophy. Your philosophy is going to determine whether or not you go for the disciplines or continue the errors that's called potential discipline. And everybody has it within their power. What was so happy for me to find out at age 25, Mr. Shove said, your own, you don't have to change country, but you do have to change philosophy. And if you'll change philosophy, not country, you can turn around your income, you turn around your bank account, you turn around your skills, you can become capable, powerful, sophisticated, healthy, influential, all the other equities that you could possibly want out of your life using the only stuff there is and not trying to change any of this stuff. Appreciate all of this stuff with all of its ups and downs, with all of its mystery of why it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Don't change challenge this. You don't have to ask for another planet. You don't have to ask for another country. Just ask for another book. Ask for another seminar. Ask for another idea. You can start the whole prosperous life. Now, I could spend the whole day on philosophy. That's where it is. If I could get you intrigued with that enough to study it, enough to ponder it, to where you'd pick up commitment like I did and say, hey, as simple as an apple a day, as simple as a walk around the block, why not start right there? If you don't start there, where else are you going to start? Might as well start where it's easy. Then go to the more complicated. Because if you can't handle the complicated, the simple disciplines, how can you handle the complicated philosophy? Here's number I gotta give these now very quickly. I got to cover linger. Number one, we're affected by philosophy. First major of the five major. Number two is attitude. We're affected by how we feel. First, we're affected by what we know decision and decisions we make. Second, we're affected by attitude, how we feel. And I gave that quick list. Let me give it to you. It's how you feel about the past. Gotta have a good attitude about the past. Use it as a school, not a club. Don't beat yourself to death with your past. Falls, failures, losses. Let the past be a school. Harsh school, maybe. What else new? Let the past be a school master to teach, not to threaten you, but Keep next is how you feel about this. That's your goal. Talk a little bit about that before we finish. Goal setting. Promise of the future is an awesome to affect your life. Every Without a future well designed, we take hesitance. All you have to have is hesitant steps for six years. Timid, driven into a corner, not boldly willing to go. Take your portion, take your next. That's how you feel about everybody else. Gotta have a good attitude about everybody else. It takes everybody else to make a market. One person doesn't make a family. One person doesn't make a business. One person doesn't make a corporation. One person doesn't make a community. One person doesn't make a nation. It takes all of us to make make a dynamic economy a nation second none it takes all of us to make sure make the economy run it takes all of us to make the possibility all the gifts that have flowed in here the last 200 years unprecedented in six and a half thousand years of recorded there's been nothing like it the ethnic streams that have flowed in here brought their gifts brought their talent brought their skills brought their inventions brought their work ethic all of it mixed together is called America been nothing like it in six and a half thousand and to miss the value of it by some you know warped attitude about it I'm telling you you've missed it all if you have an appreciation for it all you'll draw from and if you draw from all the gifts that have been blended together here for 200 years now for your value and benefit, think of what you can do for your days, for your business, for your conversation, for your equity. Transform it to an incredible thing. Here's the last how you feel about you. understanding self-worth. Self-worth should be easy. One of us can do it, all of us. If anybody can think it, we all can think it. Tom Brady, guys, is equanimity at its finest. He's also not the most athletic. But when it matters most, third and eight, do you know what his third down conversion rate is like as a quarterback? People don't understand quarterbacks. You Third and long. There's nobody in the history of football even remotely close. Not the big drive. He's great at that, too. It's the little parts of the game where you go, Rodgers, no offense to you Packers fans. It's third and 11, and he audibles out of the right play, audibles into the wrong play, and you're off the field. You don't know why you lose the NFC Championship. The other guy gets up there third and 11, audibles into the right play, and converts equanimity under duress, the separator. It's invisible. No one sees it. No one knows what it is.
it is. It's the difference. So you need equanimity. Y'all with me on that? Say yes. Yeah. You also need the power of one more. I'm writing a book right now that I really do believe is going to change the world called The Life-Changing Power of One More. There's a lot of different things I could say to you about doing one more rep in the gym, making one more phone call a day and stacking all that up, being a one more thinker. That's changed my life. I'm a one more thinker. I also get three days in one day. So I'm going to give you two gifts here. Number one, power of one more. If you add a one more multiplier to your organization, it will change everything. Maxwell calls it the law of the catalyst. You can't just be recruiting. You have to be looking for that one more special multiplier catalyst. I call it a rabbit. Someone that joins your team, they set the pace, they set the culture, they set the intensity level. In every company I own, which is 23 of them right now, I am looking for one more multiplier, Pete. Brady is a one more multiplier. Let me explain to you. Not how he, just how he works, but it's how he works. It's not how, there's this legendary story going around the last few weeks that during Super Bowl week, Brady's up watching film at 1.30 in the morning and he's texting the wide receivers at 1.30 in the morning saying, hey, third and short, you can't run this route against this DB. Third and eight, this route works against him. Hey, second and short, you can work this route against this DB, but if it's second and long, you can't run this route against him. The level of precision and specificity that he brings to the organization that nobody else understands changes it, but he's a one more multiplier. So is LeBron James. Let me explain to you. When you add a one more multiplier, they infectiously help you magnetize and attract other people like to your organization. You don't know why. I can't explain why. I think it's a vibrational frequency thing. But when I add these players, like if you added me to your team, you added me, you recruited me right now, I promise you within six or seven months, there's four or five mini me's around that were never there. But do you know that all three touchdowns in the Super Bowl were scored by dudes that weren't on the team last year that Brady recruited first? They get Brady, Gronk, AB, and Fournette all came there because of Brady. One more players that join your team are multipliers for your organization. You can't just look to add people. You can't look to add vanilla generic humans. You need to be looking for one more multipliers. And when you're recruiting and messaging, say it. Because guys like me, when I'm sitting in front of an interview with me, say, let me look, tell you what I'm really looking for. I'm looking for leaders. I'm looking for dominators. I'm looking for people who want to be somebody. When you say that word to me, you're speaking my love language. Look, if you start hustling and grinding, he'll fill it up for you. But if you ain't got no hustle and no grind, he can't fill it up. So guess what? I don't ever go there to use that land for fishing or not. But I'm changing boys' lives over there. But on top of all that, you know how many houses he done gave me? This, I'm telling you about God. Remember what I told you when I first started? Every statement I signed, when it sound like I'm talking about myself. Remember I said, say, cost God. You know how many houses I got now? <laughs> they count them up. <laughs> six for the brush, six, 12. Now, I ain't got that many houses. But the point I'm making to y'all, you have because you ask. See, I'm giving you stuff you can do. You can talk to people all day. They got video out right now. You can go online, $39.95, how to buy a house with no money down. If you stupid enough, think you can go buy a house with no money down, go ahead. You might can get it with no money down, but at closing, my story really is still about, really is, come out dirt. I have no college, all of my children. I got seven there left. I got boys, two boys come out of Mo House. I got a daughter that come out of Spelman in Berkeley. I got two daughters went to Hampton, and I got, did, and then graduated from Ohio State. I made sure all my kids went to college because I know they got to have it. But Daddy, you didn't go to college, but your ass ain't got no... <laughs> Slipped again, I'm sorry. <laughs> that came, I ain't even know that got out there. I just, I threw that one out there and I felt pretty good. I said, why is they laughing like that? <laughs> it's been important for me to empower my children, but not only my children, thousands of young people across the country. And education is the key for it. When I say college, tell nothing, not your case. It's your dream. So what you dream about? What you still dream? What is God still showing nation? It's hard. And it's not fair. One of the things I like about T. Harvest, he talks about work and investing in yourself. It's not fair when people are going up against that kind of stuff to tell them just think positive and be enthusiastic and everything will work out all right. Ain't that kind a party. It's hard. Life will put some knots on your head. I bought my first home for my mother. I was rushing, didn't know what I was doing, and I bought a home that had a lien against it. And they called me, Mr. Brown, yes, there's a lien against your property. We need $55,000 if you're going to stay there. Wait a minute, sir. I just bought this home. The guy told me there were no liens against it. I'm not the one that owe you the money. You should have checked that out, Mr. Brown. Come on. I called my 
attorney, we followed up. Yes, Les says that Lena gets the property. But he told me there were no liens. He lied, obviously. Oh my God. He told me he wanted to help me because he admired the fact that I was buying this home for my mother and that he was adopted and he, he identified with me. Les, he sucked at you. He played you, man. So what, well, would they take payment arrangements? Can I, what about $5,000 a month? They want all the money, Les. They want all the money or you're going to have to get out. The house is going up for sheriff sale. Do you have it? No, I, I don't have it. Can they give me some time? Tell them to give me, give me three months, please. Give me three months. I, my mother's in her seventies, man. She has a bad heart. Don't do this to me. This is my dream. Don't do this, man. Please t- let me talk to them. Les, I'm talking to their attorney. They don't want to talk to you. I've got to talk to their attorneys. Do you have the money? No. Will they give me three months? No. What about two months? No, Les. They want the money in seven days. Oh my God. Uh, let me call you back. I'm not sure. And I walked the floors thinking, God, how could this happen? I got to figure this out. Huh? I got to figure this out. It seemed like the days were just ticking off, ticking off. Thursday, I had to call them and let them know. They called me, Les, do you have the money? No, I don't. Friday, you have to leave. The sheriff will be there. You're going to have to leave, Les. They're going to take my house? What about my down payment? You lost it, Les. You lost it. Okay, I got to go. Yes, I prayed, Lord, please. If you show me that you're real, if if it's if you're really real, you think Paul worked for you. You you haven't seen anything. Don't let me lose this house and watch what I'll do for you. I was trying to cut a deal. <laughs> Have you ever tried to cut a deal? <laughs> it's amazing how spiritual you get when you get in trouble. You know what I mean? When I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, I was going to bed with the with the Bible and the Holy Quran and Science of Mind and Joel Goldsmith, everything I could find. I was paying to Jesus, Yahweh, Melchizedek everybody I was calling on everybody it's amazing and and there I was walking the floor at three o'clock in the morning and I had to go and wake my mother up I got on my knees and I said mama I said I need you to wake up she said what's wrong Leslie I can I can hear you walking back and forth I'm not asleep son I said there's something I need to tell you she said your eyes are red why are your eyes red because I feel so stupid now why we got to move tomorrow why Leslie there's a lien against the property and they want $55,000 and I don't have it and we're going to be set out tomorrow we have to go back to Liberty City so she said it's okay I don't like this house anyhow I said why she said because of my arthritic knees it helps it hurts my knees when I go up the steps. I said, and why didn't you tell me? Because you were so happy. I just said it because you were happy. I'll live in a shack with you, boy. I love you. It's not the house. I love you. I love all my children. I said, thank you, mama. Thank you.